Okay, so we're going to start. This is our last in class lecture. But after Thanksgiving's break, we will have um, Zoom lectures. Possibly we can cover more topics or go through anything you like. Potentially, we haven't decided exactly on that. But for today, we're going to complete the quadratic programming um, discussion. And in particular, we're going through two, two examples. The first example that we, I showed you last time is a graphical version. It's low dimensional. It's very simple. We can visualize and helps understanding. Now, I chose that example because um, if you look at classical textbooks for optimization, they always start from this sort of problems because they can draw and show that um, there are geometric meanings to these constraints and algebraic equations, which makes it easy for um, people to imagine. But then they argue that, OK, this is not a scalable approach. We need to use um, linear algebra and optimization techniques that um, you've seen some of them in this course to scale it up to higher dimensions, an arbitrary dimension and problem. But it's still the intuition that we have from low dimensional space will help us to uh, know what we're doing. So I'm going to write the problem, uh, define the quadratic programming again as a reminder. Okay, we established that a quadratic program, it's an optimization problem that our cost function has a quadratic form. You are familiar already, I'm assuming. Uh, we covered that in previous chapters. So one, one half x transpose q x plus q x plus some constant, possibly. This is a quadratic form in, in vectorized notation. x is a vector. So x is a vector in m dimensional space. Now, the key is that in the generic definition of quadratic program, we do have constraints. And you see that we have inequality constraints, where you see that we, can, we have a linear equation, matrix A time, times x. We have this inequality, and B is a vector. We also, we can have equality equation. And we can have lower bound and write it like this, lower bound and upper bound. So we have a lot of freedom. We can say that my variable x should be larger than this value, smaller than this value. We want to satisfy some equality condition. This, this equality condition is similar to um, problems we had before, solving a linear system. And then we can have inequality equation that um, says that we, a particular matrix A times our vector should produce a vector that is less than b. And the notation, I think, is introduced this curly inequality means that it's, it's a vector. It's not a scalar. 
and the meaning for a vector to be less than another vector, I think, is each element to be less than that. But for a matrix, that, that takes a much deeper uh, condition because the matrix uh, must be negative definite or positive definite if it's greater than. Okay, so this is, a, this is the general problem. And Q, you see that it says to be symmetric means Q transpose equals Q. That means it's symmetric. It means if you look at any off-diagonal element, and if you mirror it with respect to the diagonal line, you'll see the same element. That's the sign that this matrix is symmetric. And then if you take the transpose of it, you get the same matrix. On top of that, Q must be positive definite. There are several ways to check if a matrix is, a po is positive definite, but the one that we can use based on what we have learned so far is that X transpose Q times X, which is going to be in the scalar, this must be positive. And X is non-zero. So these are our condition. And this is called a quadratic program. So we're going to find the value of x that minimizes this quadratic objective function. Let's go through the first example. So let's define a cost function j to be, so by the way, what we're going through is how to formulate a problem. So 50% of the challenge in general in engineering and in most of the research is how to formulate the problem. Once you know how to formulate the problem, Usually, if the problem is not super exotic or it's studied before, that there's a good chance most problems are studied before. So if it, it does come turn into a standard form or if you manage to turn it into a standard form, such as quadratic program, we can find a solver and then we just enter our, we learn how to work with the solver and enter our data inputs and then we get the solution. So this is the common practice and you should do it whenever you can, unless developing that solver is part of your work in research. Some people's job is to write numerical linear algebra libraries, write down solvers. That's a specific field and area. If that's not the case, you can just use it, move on with your life, and solve your problem. So 50% of the job is formulating the problem. And by that, I mean you have a description. You need to write down your form, uh, variables, decide what's your decision variable. That's where it comes from. You need to make decision. This is my variable that I want to uh, solve for it. And that's how I'm going to formulate it. So here we use a quadratic function that we can already see what's the solution. So can somebody tell me what's the minimizer of J? What is the optimal value of X? If we assume X is X1, X2, Two and one, that's right. Well, our objective function has two squared um, terms. 
they cannot be negative. The minimum value for the objective function is zero. And to make the entire um, objective function zero, we need to make each term zero. Therefore, x1 equals two and x2 equals one is the optimal solution. So this type of simple example is very helpful when you learn something. You want to always start from something like this because you can track everything in your mind and you deeply understand the process. Whereas if the problem is larger scale, more complicated, um, sometimes it's hard to track it. We don't track, we don't, we can't track the details in our mind. We just rely on the, our intuition that this is just a generalization of a simpler problem that I knew. We know mathematically it's correct. We just can't track it like a computer. All right, so I am going to expand this. I say x1 squared plus 4 minus 4 x1 plus x2 squared plus 1 minus 2 x2. Okay, so I am going to turn this into a quadratic form. I'm going to say, and to do that first, I'm going to work on the quadratic part because I want to construct this part. So if I write x1, x2 as a row vector, and I will need a two by two matrix, I don't know what it is now, an x1, x2, let's see if we can do this. Um, well, if the matrix is just identity, we will get x1 squared plus x2 squared. That's easy. Can we come up with a Q a row vector Q that we can multiply it by x1 and x2. How about minus four and minus two? That's exactly what we see. But also there's a constant term, plus five. Now, this part It does not affect your solution because it's constant, but more generally because it does not depend on the value of x. No matter what you choose for the value of x, 5 is a 5, and it's not going to change the solution of the problem. So in fact, in a lot of optimization packages, they don't even take that. So you just drop it. But if you want to visualize it, if you do want to know the value of your objective function, of course, you, should, you shouldn't forget to include that five. But it does not affect the solution. So I can add a remark here. Okay. Oh, maybe I should finish that. So then I can say this is x transpose q x plus q x plus c. Now q is the identity matrix. Small q is minus 4, minus 2, and constant is 5. The identity is just popped up because of uh, making sense of what I expanded for the quadratic form, right? So if I had, for example, 2x1 squared, I needed a 2 on the first uh, entry of the matrix. So now if we expand this quadratic form, we end up with what I expanded uh, earlier, and then we can collect it into what the problem told us, the objective function is. 
Now, why we're doing this? Well, because the optimization package will want you to enter Q, small Q, and your matrices of inequalities um, to solve the problem. So the optimization package um, will not take a generic form of cost function. It wants you to enter these matrices. And it has become a standard practice of writing a software like that, so everybody is just doing it like this. Okay, so now, remark. If you maximize a function, it's the same as maximizing that function plus a constant. Same true for the minimization problem. Again, if you need to evaluate the cost function for some reason in some algorithms, that's important to take into account the constant but it will not change the optimal x, because if you take the gradient, the gradient of the constant is zero. Okay, this is, I'm gonna number them for you. Two. What else? Um, if you maximize f of x, this is the same as negative of minimizing negative of f of x. And arg max of f of x, so remember when we say maximize f of x, that's one way to write the problem. But when we say arg max, that means we're generating an output. The output of argmax is x. But the output of max f of x is the value of f of x evaluated at optimal x. This is the same as arg mean of negative of negative f of x. Okay, so these, four equivalent problems will come handy because sometimes the optimization package that you use, it doesn't maximize, it just minimize. When you have a problem, you want to maximize a function, no problem, you minimize the negative of that function. That's just the way of entering your problem into the computer. Most, most packages minimize most of the time. It, we don't usually have a maximization uh, interface. Okay, going back to our problem, we want to, oh, we did have some constraints too. So that was the cost function. I need to, I'm gonna add the constraints here. So my constraints are x1 plus 2x2 smaller than 12, 3x1 plus 3x2 smaller than or equal to 25, x1 smaller than 7, x2 smaller than 5. Now you might have all these constraints, you might not have any, you might have one. So anything is possible. For example, if you are trying to find 
the optimal weight for a material that the factory wants to order, well, that must be positive. But maybe if you're trying to estimate a profit, um, cash flow, that can be negative. You're bleeding cash, and then that can be negative. It doesn't have to be positive. So depending on the problem, you might want it to be positive, negative, have certain bounds. That's mathematically, there's no problem of defining that. That comes down to a particular problem we want to solve. Now, the practice we want to do, we want to write this in the vectorized form. For these two, I can, first thing I can say that 1x1, 2x2, 3x1, 3x2 times x1, x2. Now these are things we learned how to write a system of linear equations in the matrix form early on in the course. That's what we're doing. Okay, this is, oh, sorry. This is the inequality constraint. So we can say this is A inequality, X, B inequality. So the software wants you to enter matrix and vectors instead of bothering entering them one by one because then that will make the input line way too long. So we carefully define our matrices and vectors and then it's, it looks very compact on the screen when we look at it. How about these guys? I think I can convert them into These, these are, this is four, we have four lines, but these four are actually two constraints, right? Because we have, we have x1 greater than zero, smaller than seven. We have x2 greater than zero, smaller than five. Then I can write this as lower bound, All right. No, but this is a still inequality. How can we resolve this? Well, this is just the identity matrix times x. Okay, so I can say that zero, zero, identity matrix. The reason I'm doing this because later we want to enter it in the in Julia, then it will make sense once we code it. All right, so now another thing that we can do now, because of particular solver that we're using, it wants you to combine everything. For example, MATLAB doesn't want you to combine anything. It says that just enter inequalities together, lower bound separately, and equality constraints separately. And Jesse wrote a wrapper for the QP solver to do that. Feel free to use it. Um, I think because he said it wasn't complete, I used the original interface. But it's a good practice for you, maybe convert it back and forth. I, I suggest practicing like that. So how, how can I? Anybody can help me to stack these constraints. One and two should be, this should be one. Combine one and two. Any idea how to do it? No. 
No idea. How about we just stack them? Well, the, the first one doesn't have, that's the tricky part, right? The first one doesn't have a lower bound. What are we going to put there? Don't you worry. We can say negative infinity. That's how we entered in Julia. You could write negative infinity too on the paper. Well, there is no hard bound. So we can say 0, 0, and then we have 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, 0, 0, 1. We have x1, x2. So this is 4 by 2. 2 by 1, it will give us 4 by 1. So all your hard work in linear algebra pays off here. You should be comfortable looking at these. Um, strange matrices, they can be really tall, lots of constraints. We understand what's going on. Now we can also stack our vectors of upper bounds, 12, 25, seven, five. All right, so we have, this looks, didn't get any better. <laughs> I don't want to try again. <laughs> so again, this is a really nice way, compact way. You want to write a report, makes a lot of sense. But particular software we're going to use takes it like this in Julia. And, well, let me add the figure again. Because in Julia, I think, I generated this figure in MATLAB. So at the time, I was looking for Julia's QP solver. So I generated the figure in MATLAB. All right, so what, what we're, you're looking at here is that I am plotting my Cox function j. It's, the, it's called a contour plot. Plot your surface. j is a function of x1 and x2. In 3D, plane, in 3D space, that's the surface. Pick all the combinations of x1 and x2 values and then plot that, that gives you a surface. Now, pick some resolution, let's say every 0 0.5 unit along the z-axis height, and then draw a plane and then cut your surface. And then project all the lines that this plane will cut as you move up on XY plane, and then look from the top view. That will give you the contour plot. And I'm adding colors to show the values of the function. For example, the line that you see has 60 or 40. That's the line that that plane that had the height of 40 cut the surface. So all the all the um, the curve, the line that you see has 40. The function has the same value all over that line. Now this, this is, you might have seen this in topography uh, maps, in civil engineering or architecture. Um, they, they want to, they get a land, they want to know what's the topography of the land. They have this sort of um, plots, it's easy to read, they can see the shape of the land and they can see the height in a 2D map, it's very handy. But this is called contour plot. Is it like this? <laughs> There's an O, right? Yeah, that makes more sense. 
Okay, then I plot the lines. Like my constraints tell me that x1 plus 2x2 equals 12. Well, if you uh, find a regressor form, x2 in, form, in terms of x1, then you can plot the line. That's what I'm doing. For the other one, again, 3x1 plus 3x2 equals 25. Find x2 in terms of everything else and then draw the line. x1 equals 7, that's a vertical line. x2 equals 5, that's a horizontal line. Now draw all the lines and remember, this is, these are equalities because these are the lines. So the inequality was telling us x1 must be less than 7, x2 must be less than 5, and the first two ones should be less than 12 and 25. So the, the region that all constraints are satisfied are, is called the feasible region. And for us, this, this dark blue region near the origin, that's the feasible solution. And we can see our vector of 2 and 1, right? That's, that falls in the feasible region, and then the function has the value of 0. Now, you might ask, well, we, why we needed the constraint? It didn't do anything. We can drop all the constraints, and that's the point. Sometimes you can drop the constraints because they're inactive. Now, my, I, I recommend you go and play with the constraint, change the problem later in the code, and see how the solution will change and relate it to this graph. For example, imagine I move x1 equals 7 to x1 equals 1. Then x1 can no longer be 2 because that's not in the feasible region. So then that, that's, the, uh, that's where the solution will be uh, possibly close to that boundary. x1 maybe ends up being 1 based on what we see. So then, then the constraint is active because it's actively changing the solution. So in general, if the now in the modern solvers, they might check if the constraint is, sol is active, inactive, they might drop it. That's something that you will learn in the more detailed um, course on optimization later. There are some methods to check that. They have fancy names, I don't wanna confuse you by dropping the names. But if you do want to know, ask it on Piazza. I'll, I'll, I'll point you to that direction. Okay, so this was a graphical model, uh, solution. It helped a lot. That's what people used to do. But then they realized, well, that's not going to work. Even if I have three variables, this method is no longer useful. So let's go to Julia quickly. Uh, I do have the file myself. So I wanted you to have this file, but I think there is a problem. But anyway, you will have access to this file. And maybe Trippy can upload it on Canvas. You can upload it. But later, we want to make it available so you can fetch from Illumidesk. And I am running it on Illumidesk to make sure it's reproducible for you guys too. Okay, so what I'm doing, QSQP is the package. I am just adding the QSQP package and I need compact package, compact package because I want to use, um, the solver wants me to define two of the matrices as a sparse type. If it's not a sparse, it, it doesn't process uh, the inputs. So that I just had to go through it and see what it wants. And then once I figured it, it became easy because next time I could just copy my previous problem and then change it to the new problem. All right, so this is done. This is here is our first problem. It is not our first problem. <laughs> the numbers are different. We should update the numbers in example one, but I'm gonna leave it in the interest of time because we have another example. But the numbers here in the code are correct. Now, one thing you notice, Q is called here P, small Q is Q, and lower bound is L, 
Upper bound is U. Inequality coefficients are A. Now, you notice that P, or Q, here is a diagonal matrix of 2 and 2. It's not identity. Just because the solver considers one half of Q transpose Q, uh, X transpose QX, so to compensate that one half, I need to add this. Otherwise, your solution will vary. Okay? In then I just define my vector uh, problem data, P, Q, A, L, U. A and P must be sparse. So you define your matrix as usual, just pass it to the sparse array. Then I create a problem here. You're gonna, we need, so in line, Twelve. I'm creating an object for, from the QSQP package. Then I'm setting up my problem in line 15 by just saying that, okay, that, take that problem, P, Q, A, L, U, and set them up. And line 18, just solve it. We don't care what's inside, what's going to happen. It's none of our business. That's, um, unless we're going to get paid to look into that and do that job, we just want to solve it. Okay? And I'm not saying that because it's Rob 101, a lot of graduate students do that too. Unless that's your research, you usually want to pick a solver and um, solve your problem. And results.x will give you the solution. Let me run this. And, and that's it, this is the code. So all the hard work was having a package, a solver, and being able to write down your problem and understanding how to write it in the standard form, vectorized form. And then you, in, in 20 lines of code, we solved our problem. Now this problem could be very large. That doesn't make the number of lines any longer. Okay. The Lumi desk is a slow, but this should be really fast. This is a very small problem. So the solution is 1.9999 and 0 0.9, right? So x1 is almost two up to machine precision, and x2 is almost one. So we could verify our hand calculation and graphical model with this solution, and it gives you just a bunch of garbage that is describing um, authors. <laughs> That's how much we respect the authors of the package, but these, these are just status of the optimization. That, um, you, you, for a real problem, you do care. You need to look into it to make sure it's solving it correctly. Otherwise, maybe it's giving you a warning that this solution is not reliable for some reason. All right, so let's move to the second example. This one is interesting. It is called Maximum Margin Classifier. This is a most basic version of a famous classification uh, method called Support Vector Machine. That's something you're going to learn in machine learning course. A much more sophisticated version of that. Hopefully they still teach it, I think. It's not replaced by deep learning. Uh, okay, so example two. Now this is a version, this is a very, this is a, the simplest version of that. It's also called hard margin classifier. There are lots of variation of it to make it better. 
because if you work with more complicated data, um, things might not be as nice as in our synthetic data set that I'm showing you here. In particular, there's no overlap between data. It's nicely separable using a line. All right, let's see. We want to separate red circles with blue, class, uh, blue crosses, uh, class one, class one, and class negative one. You could label it the other way around. It doesn't matter. Black line is the ground truth solution. That's, how, that's what I used to generate the data set. I generated using some random number. And magenta is the, um, it's the solution. It's the line that I solved using a QP. Now, how to solve this problem? Well, I am after, in general, a hyperplane. The equation of hyperplane is a transpose x plus yeah, I'm just going to write it like this. B, some constant, right? So a transpose x is the dot product, right? So a was the normal vector, whether normalized or not, it was orthogonal to the hyperplane. And this could be line in 2D space. All right, so this is my model. I, I have each cross, each cross or circle is a data point xi. So x i is 2D. It's a location on the plane. If I know the coordinates x1 and x2, I know where we're talking about. Then I can read the label. So the label, so these x i's in machine learning language, they're called inputs, which is obvious also in math language. And labels are plus minus one, and we call them y i belongs to a set that can either be negative one or plus one. And these are called target values, target or Output. Now again, in regression, outputs are continuous. In classification, the outputs are labeled, discrete, just like plus one, negative one. And this is an instance of supervised learning because I have the labels. That's just a side note. When you don't have these labels, Y labels, that's unsupervised. And then they're going to make you crazy, semi-supervised, weekly supervised, <laughs> self-supervised, every day something. But all of them fits into one of these two categories. It's, the problem is either supervised or unsupervised. It's supervised if you have labels. You know the correct answer, right? It's unsupervised if you don't know the labels. You don't know the correct answer to guide the model, find the parameters. That's really the idea. All right, so, so I do have x transpose x i plus b equals um, to zero, right? I want to find a line, so this is not zero. So I'm gonna create a data set first. Data set D is the set of all x i and y i pairs. And I have n of these points. 
When somebody tells you, here's a data set, go and do a supervised learning on it. You immediately think about, OK, what is, the, what is the input? What are the labels? Maybe we try maximum margin classifier. See if it works. If it works, you charge the customer. If it doesn't, you maybe try another model. Maybe try deep learning now. So given this data set, I want to formulate a problem. This is the hard part, right? Because we kind of need to see it one time, or the first person who did it, obviously, that was interesting, because previously people didn't think about it that way. And that was very interesting. So how about I say x, 0. I'm just going to convert this model to w transpose x equals 0. And then I define w to be a and b. Okay. And then I also, well, I need to make this, um, let's say, x bar. And then x bar is just x and 1. So I'm just including the bias term. This, this is called bias. And this is called just coefficient. You don't need a name. So that's the bias. I'm including the bias in the weight vector. OK, so if I have these data sets, I'm going to say minimize 1 half of norm squared of weights subject to x w transpose x bar i. This should be greater than 1. 1 is my margin, right? If it's 0, that's, so I have y equals 0, I have y equal 1 then I have y equal negative 1. Now, this 1 is the margin. You can choose another value. That's, that's called hard margin. In fact, in another way of formulating the problem, you pick 1 to be a variable and solve for the margin that is the optimal value. Now, if yi is plus 1, w transpose xi bar less than negative 1, if yi is negative 1. And I can just write this as solve over w. Here is my quadratic form. And I can combine these two constraints as y times w transpose x bar i greater than 1. OK? This is my quadratic form. Now, looks a little compact, and we need to see how to code it. I'm just going to go quickly to, because we're out of time. Here, the first, so this is my problem, right? Here, I am just generating data. Right? It looks silly and long. Maybe you can come up with one-liners to generate the data set, see if you can do that. I'm just creating a bunch of data points. And then I'm plotting it. I'm not going to run it again. So you can see my randomly generated two data sets. I think the colors are changed, but it doesn't matter. You get the idea. And here is the code. I am defining my P, Q, A. Q is obviously small q is 0. P was the identity matrix. Now, this line 8, you might want to think about it. First of all, I'm using a negative sign because the constraint was saying greater than 0. The, sol the solver takes inequality constraint in a, fo in a form that a times x is less than some bound. That's why I'm negativing my a. And I'm taking all the target value. t is the target value here. And I use dot star to enforce these constraints that says y times the uh, w transpose x. because 
based on if yi is positive or negative, that will change the inequality. We combine two inequalities into one. So line A, think about it. Ask your questions on Piazza. Lower bound, infinity. I'm defining upper bound, that's my margin. And I'm solving it. And here's my results, I'm getting my W, which the first two is my A, the last one is the bias B. And I'm writing the regression, regressor form. My W is, um, I'm sending everything the other side, make them negative, right? Dividing by W2 to free the coefficient of X2. To create a line, then I'm generating X and Y is W line Y times X line plus W line three. Now you need to go through it and think about it, this part, and then let's discuss it on Piazza or office hours. And here we are with our classifier. This is a line, and this is where we're gonna end it. This is a line that separates you from those who took Rob 101 and those who didn't. <laughs> so we're, do we have any questions? We're done, we're, we're out of time. No? So the last example is really interesting, but I know it, I just squeezed it into a few minutes. But unless you go through it yourself, it's also not very helpful. I'm showing you code. So I want you to go through the code, and if it doesn't make any sense, let us know why, and then we can talk over it. Thanks for joining us.